In this video, we're going to discuss atomic spectroscopy and how it can be used to learn and identify the internal structure of the atom. We'll begin with a quick overview of some of the objectives of the video itself. Uh, we're going to start with a recap of the Bohr model, uh, focusing primarily on this right here. There are limitations to how we can interpret this Bohr model. We'll make sure that we're clear about what those limitations are. That leaves us then into the concept of atomic absorption and release of energy, and ultimately something a little bigger known as quantum mechanics, and that will be the majority of our discussion. And then last but not least, that leads us into the idea of spectroscopy itself. It is a tool to measure what's going on in terms of all of this atomic structure stuff, and it does that in the form of measuring what type of light comes out based on the structure of the atom itself. And as we talked about, it's a way of inferring what that structure is based on the light that we actually see. Well, one of the applications of this before we actually dive into the video is this picture you see here. This might look very complicated, uh, but what you can see here is the full rainbow from red all the way down to violet. Uh, and what we can see is there's these tiny little gaps here in the actual pictures. There's dark spots in the rainbow. Uh, this is actually a spectra recorded of our natural sunlight. And what it's showing here is that these elements, certain elements in the outer atmosphere of the sun are absorbing specific wavelengths of light. So the sun emits the full rainbow, and then the elements in the outer atmosphere of the sun absorb certain colors of light and leave a characteristic arrangement of these dark lines. This is how scientists are capable of looking at a star that might be millions of light years away and being able to figure out what that star is primarily made of because each element leaves its own characteristic arrangement of these dark lines. So let's really quickly recap the Bohr model itself as a visual model of the atom. If you recall, electrons travel in concentric rings around the nucleus. Electrons occupy the lowest available rings that are there. Each ring itself has a maximum capacity. Remember, it's two for the first ring, eight for the second ring, et cetera, et cetera. And then the arrangement of electrons is based in this model, can potentially predict the chemical properties of the atom itself. But as we've already talked about, this is a very simple model, and as a result of being a very simple model, it doesn't really do a whole lot of predictions. And this is what we've talked about so far with the Bohr model itself. I don't want to get too much more detail than that. What we want to focus on today is not the Bohr model as a visual model representing what an atom looks like, but the Bohr model as an energy model of the atom. And this is actually a much better way of using, uh, interpreting the Bohr model itself. What it now talks about is that the rings represent possible energy levels that an electron can have. And what we can add into this is that they do not represent location. And this is the common misconception with this, is that the rings represent location, but really what they're representing is possible energy levels that we have. And we can redraw our Bohr model in that context, showing that as we go out on the ring, electrons are absorbing energy, and if we go in on the rings, from higher rings to lower, electrons are emitting energy. The higher the ring number we have means a significantly amount of more energy. And electrons can absorb or release energy, and they do that by changing levels. So an electron on the first ring, for example, can jump up to the third ring here, but to do that it has to absorb however much energy there is that separates these two rings together. So what you can kind of start to see from this is that this is a visual representation of what are really just numerical values, the difference between the energy at the higher level versus the energy here at the lower level. So move outwards represents the uh, electron absorbing energy to go to a higher energy level, and then a move inward represents the electron releasing energy. And this, again, is going to play a very big role in what we talk about in spectroscopy uh, later on in this section. So now we start to get into the part of this model that represents um, how spectroscopy actually works. The first thing we'll say here is that electrons can only absorb or release the exact amount of energy needed to change from one or more levels, meaning my electron can be on level one, and however much energy, we'll call this energy level one here, so it can have the amount of energy in energy level one, and it can jump up to energy level two, which is the second ring, or it can jump up to energy level three, and those are the only allowed jumps that an electron can make in the Bohr model itself. Electrons can never have amounts of energies between level, meaning my electron can't jump itself halfway between level one and level two. So what the Bohr model shows us is that there are limitations to the amount of energy that an electron can have. It can have this quantity of energy, or it can have that quantity of energy, but it can't have any of the energy values in between. And this is the basis for something we'll talk about later called quantum mechanics, and it's also the reasoning for why uh, spectroscopy is able to do the things that it does. But again, that'll come a little later on down the road. 
So let's get into a little bit more detail here about what's actually going on in terms of electrons being able to jump to higher levels and jump to lower levels. That's going to be the basis for what we're going to talk about with spectroscopy. So the first thing we say, we'll start with a, a Mach Bohr model here with a couple different energy levels in it. Again, we can call these energy level 1, energy level 2, and energy level 3. Electrons, as we talked about earlier in this section, always start on the lowest available energy level. And we're going to start with an atom that just has one electron in it for the sake of simplicity. This lowest available energy state is known as the ground state of the electron. It's the state that the electron is when it's in its natural placement via the rules for filling up the Bohr model itself. Now, if we provide some sort of outside energy source, say for example a heat source, we can apply heat to our atom and that heat can be absorbed by the electron. And if we absorb just the right amount, exactly the right amount of energy, that can cause that electron to jump from a lower energy level up to a higher energy level. And this process is now noted, or this electron is now noted as being in the excited state. It's at a state above where it would normally be placed as its lowest available energy level. And it got there because of the outside source of heat that we're able to provide into here. So we've now promoted an electron to the excited state. The electrons eventually now are going to fall back down to their original starting state. This is a high potential energy state. Uh, most substances in our universe don't like to be in those high potential energy states. They naturally move towards lower energy states and it's going to fall back down. Now here's the catch. To jump up in levels, to go to the higher level, we had to absorb energy in the form of heat. When we come back down in levels, no matter how the energy was absorbed, it's going to be released in the form of light. And to show that light's released here, we'll draw this squiggly little line representing a photon of light, and we'll represent it with the, um, the symbol H nu, because if you recall, that's the uh, mathematical way we used to uh, represent light itself. So the energy that was absorbed by the heat is now being released as light. The color, and this is probably the most important statement on the whole page, the color or type of light corresponds to the amount of energy between the two levels. In this case, that corresponds to the jump between energy level 2 and energy level 1. And we can actually do some math here. We could say energy level 2 minus energy level 1 is the amount of energy that came out of this light. And that's got to be equal to Planck constant times the frequency of the light, which we ultimately could coordinate to some sort of wavelength, which again corresponds to the color of the light. So the difference in the energy levels from high to low corresponds to how much energy was released in the light that was given off. That can then be used to calculate the wavelength of light, which we correspond to a particular color. So what we can say from this is that an atom gives off a particular color of light based on the size of the jump that the electrons inside that atom make based on the gaps that are present in the actual Bohr model itself. Where this starts to get interesting then is the fact that different atoms have different arrangement to these color lines. Let's call this guy atom A, and we'll call this guy atom B. If you notice, atom A can have electrons fall from the top level down to the second level. It can have electrons fall from the top level down to the first level, and it can have electrons fall from the first, second level down to the first level. These are the three different statistical types of things that can happen here. And each one of these jumps is going to give off a unique wavelength of light based on the size of the different gaps between the different levels. So since each jump represents a different thing, we're going to get three different colors of light from this particular atom. Now atom B has the same number of levels, but it has a different arrangement of rings. So when electrons fall down between these guys, so it can fall from ring one to ring ring three to ring one, ring three to ring two, and then finally from ring two to ring one, we're again going to get three different colors of light being emitted by these three different jumps. And these three different colors of nights, again, are unique to the arrangement of the rings in this atom versus the arrangement of the rings. So again, we're going to get another three different colors. And what this tells us then is that the color of light we get off correspond to the arrangement 
of the rings inside of our atoms. And because each element has its own unique arrangement, each element gives off its own unique set of colors. This is something we'll use later in the chapter as a tool to identify an element. The spectra that we create from these different atoms actually are unique every single time you look at them, and we can use them almost like a fingerprint to identify a particular element. But that's something we'll talk about a little later on down the road. So let's get to the last part of the uh, discussion here, the idea of what spectroscopy is itself. Uh, spectroscopy is a process where we can record these colors of lights that atoms give off, and we can do that using a device known as a spectrometer. Now a spectrometer is basically a device that separates light by color, just like a prism does, and I think we've all probably played with one of those at some point. And then it provides a measuring tool for us to measure the different wavelengths or frequencies, and most devices let you do both, that are given off by the different jumps happening inside of each atom. Since each atom or compound has different energy jumps inside that atom, it will give off its own unique array of colored lines. And this arraignment of colored lines is known as a spectrum, or in the plural form, spectra. This arrangement of colored lines, as I already kind of mentioned earlier in the video, tells us information about the arrangement of rings in the atom. And because it is unique to each individual element, it can be used to identify unknown substances. Just like a fingerprint can be used to identify an unknown person in a crime, these spectra, or spectra, act as fingerprints for that particular element. And every time I see that spectra later on down the line, I can connect it back to a particular substance that I've already recorded the spectrum of. So these uh, spectra that we're able to record come in two major types. Uh, the one we're going to be dealing with primarily in this section is something known as emission spectroscopy. Uh, what we do when we do emission spectroscopy is we crowd lots of energy into the atoms. This can be in the form of heat or commonly electricity. And as a result of pumping in lots of heat and electricity, the atoms absorb and then release energy based on the gaps between the levels. We get a unique arrangement of colored lines for each individual element or compound. The other type of spectroscopy we're going to be doing works in the same exact way, uh, but it's absorption spectroscopy. What we do is we pass the full spectrum of all light through the atoms. So we put the whole rainbow through them, and the atoms specifically absorb only the wavelengths that correspond to their specific energy jumps. So here's the key point for absorption spectroscopy. What we see as a result of that is a full rainbow with a unique arrangement of black gaps where the atoms absorb their specific wavelengths. And again, the arrangement of those black gaps corresponds back to a particular element or compound. This is what we saw uh, earlier in the discussion where we talked about the spectrum given off by the sun. And we can see what elements are in the outer atmosphere of the sun that absorb specific colors uh, from the full rainbow that the internal part of the sun emitted. So we have here is a quick picture of what this might look like. Uh, I believe this is the spectrum for the element hydrogen. And this is one we'll definitely look at when we're in class. Uh, what we can see here is that first we have the absorption spectrum of hydrogen. We see that we see the full rainbow here and we see these black lines and each one of these black lines corresponds to a type of light that corresponds to a particular amount of energy that was specifically absorbed by the atom because it matched up with one of the jumps that an electron was making. Likewise down here we have the emission spectra of this particular substance. And what we see here is the black. We put in a type of energy that was not visible as light. The atom absorbed that energy and then released it in the form of light. And again, we get the specific unique colors that correspond to the specific jumps that atoms can make inside the atom itself. What I want you to notice is that both spectra are pretty much showing us the same thing. The gaps from the absorption spectrum match up perfectly with the colored lines from the emission spectra. It's two different ways of showing the specific energy levels that an atom absorbs uh, and corresponds to the internal structure of the atom itself. So that's pretty much it. Uh, at this stage in the game, you should be able to describe primarily the misconceptions that go along with the Bohr model and its real purpose, which is really an energy level diagram. It shows us how electrons can jump up and down between levels. Not really a picture of what the atom looks like. Uh, you should be able to explain now how atoms are able to absorb or release energy in the form of jumps between energy levels, and then ultimately how spectroscopy can be used to keep track of these jumps and start learning about the internal structure of the atom. Last but not least, you should be able to interpret the difference between absorption and emission spectra, uh, and you should be able to look at a spectra and know is this an absorption one or an emission. This is something we'll be practicing a whole lot more in class. You'll be recording your own spectra, primarily the emission spectra flavor, uh, and I think via that you should hopefully get a much better understanding of how this whole process works.